Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's another cool Tuesday evening. Tuesday, yes, yes, Tuesday evening. <laughs> How is everybody? How is everybody? Our Presidente is going live soon, I believe. So, that will be interesting. Is it more lockdown? Is it less lockdown? Is it a longer lockdown? Oof, who knows? Just gonna have to wait and see what he says. Yeah, hopefully not for sure. Hmm. Yeah, Durban's been a little bit hectic because the area we're in, they've decided that there's been quite too many um, uh, coronavirus uh, infected individuals, and so it's since yesterday it's it's been incredibly hectic. They've been um, the army has been walking around um, ensuring that businesses that are closed are staying closed, that um, uh, people are not unnecessarily wandering around and causing nonsense. Um, they've gone way hectic with the, um, on the freeways and on the highways, the stopping, pulling people over, making sure that they're you know, being checked, um, being checked for, for whether or not they have a temperature. It's, it's ramped up since the beginning of this week. Yeah, it's, it's been a bit crazier than usual. <sighs> All right. Yeah, there's there's plenty of that kind of stuff on on Facebook, WhatsApp groups, all over the place. Lots of people are, are sharing this stuff, and to some extent, it's like okay, it's it's good to know what's going on to kind of see, make sure that. Um, you know, you don't do anything or take any chances that you shouldn't be. Um, so that's okay on the one side. But on the other hand, it's like, it gets depressing because people just, there's, it's a never-ending stream of fear and doubt and uncertainty and pulls you down. So yeah, for, from my side, it's I I largely skip a lot of that stuff. If if there's anything that's that's kind of um, you know I need to be aware of, I have no doubt it'll be either my wife or my in-laws who are who are staying with us during this lockdown will be telling me, "Hey, did you hear about this? Did you see that video?" Okay, fine. they're 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 my filter to to some extent. <laughs> Although even with them, it's like, uh, why are you making me see this? It's so pointless. Yeah. Otherwise, I hope everyone is well, safe and healthy. Taking care of yourselves. Um, these are certainly tough times that we're in. Um, but be strong and even this shall pass. All right, on that note, I think let's get into it. So today's session is going to be about teamwork. Um, and it's teamwork is a, a difficult topic. Um, but right, before we get into those, a um, few things to take note of. All of our sessions are uploaded to um, YouTube. So YouTube link, if you just scroll down a bit, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to drop them there. If you want to have more of a conversation, we have a Discord server as well. Again, scroll down a bit, join, pop into our Discord server, um, and we're around if you want to chat, if you want to ask any questions, or just generally kind of see what people are are talking about um, so that's that's the community that we are trying to create um, so feel free to pop in anytime um, a few disclaimers 
right? I am not claiming to be any kind of expert. I will share what I have learned, what I have seen, what I know new employees struggle with. Not everything works for everyone. You have to pick and choose what makes sense for you, what fits with your style, what fits with your attitude. We will talk about things that can seem very abstract. That is what happens when you have little or no experience. You have no way of understanding unless you've been in those situations, in those environments. Remembering what we talk about will shine a clearer light on these situations when we encounter them. There are a wide range of companies, cultures and environments out there. So there's a decent chance that we talk about things that you will never encounter in your career. Nonetheless, forewarned is forearmed. There are exceptions to probably every single thing I say. Situations are really simple and it is only our lack of understanding that makes situations seem simple. Finally, I am South African and my experiences and knowledge is based around the South African market and South African companies. Since these videos are available for anyone in the world to watch, please keep that localization in mind. Right. What is Code to Career? The aim of Code to Career is to create a community for software developers, especially those with little to no experience. It is a place for them to get information on what to expect in the working world. I have worked with many juniors and interns over the years, and this is my way of trying to help them bridge that gap when entering the professional space. Alrighty, with that done, let's get into it. One moment. All right. Just preparing a few notes. Okay. <clears throat> Teamwork is hard, plain and simple. But for anyone you can ask, that's not the impression you get. And the reason is because most places are happy with a team that moves forward and doesn't destroy itself. But getting a team to function like a well-oiled machine is hard. There are so many levels on which we may not match. Skill, motivation, experience, personality, life, our ability to grow, our mood on the day and many, many more. Some of these are fairly set, if diverse. Others can change on a daily basis. So getting a team to synergize well, consistently, is incredibly tough. When I try to think of how to think of yourself in a team, there's one phrase that comes to mind, and that is self-realization before God-realization. It's the idea that we need to know what we are, who we are, what we are capable of. The idea of, it is of utmost importance for us to learn how well we can stand on our own two feet before we can fit well in a team. People will ask you questions around your capabilities. They will also rely on you to put those capabilities into action. If you don't have a good idea of what you can do, it becomes rather difficult to find the best way to fit you into a team. Often, you will be placed in a team with certain expectations. You may miss the mark, because placements are often hit and miss. People, managers, and team leads are working with imperfect information. It's important to take the positives out of those situations. There can be many reasons the placement may fail. 
but blaming the team, others, situations or deadlines will not help you in any way going forward. The aim always is to focus on getting better. Thinking about reasons for failure, both yours and others, is good for learning. But if you're not learning from that, then it is rather pointless. For most developers, you're going to kind of be doing both at the same time. You're going to be learning about yourself as you're learning about what you can do. And it's going to be happening at the same time. The, the, the important point is to fairly regularly kind of just take a pause and take note of where you are and just where you are, how much you've learned. Just update the catalog of your knowledge on that particular topic of yourself. Um, many developers don't do that and they seem to be fine with that, which for me is not the best thing. You know, often you'll hear the phrase, I wish I could rewrite code I'd written even six months ago. So to some extent, there is this understanding that, you know what, I've gotten better. I can, I can see what I've done poorly in the past and what I can do better now. But it's also important to kind of take note of that more regularly rather than only opportunistically when you may happen to see a piece of code that you'd written some time back. Something I've, talked, I've touched on in a previous discussion, the idea of power levels. Few jobs have a power difference the way software development can. Some senior developers can do an amazing job of a task in three days. Others can do a poor job and take two weeks to do it. Be humble in your strengths and your weaknesses. People would be at different levels of strengths and often their position or their role is not a good indicator. So assume that everyone can be a good developer until proven otherwise. And if they're not, talk to them. Help them if you can. Encourage them. You all are, after all, all on the same team and you all are all on the same journey. Being part of a team means working with people. And working with people it is a critical skill that can be learned and improved. It does not mean that you need to be a smooth talker like a James Bond. It also doesn't mean that you need to be super confident and always know exactly what you're talking about. It does mean that you need to be aware of your coworkers, how the things you say are perceived by them, know when to speak and when to stay quiet, follow when you must follow and lead when you must lead, apologize when you have made mistakes, both technical and non-technical in nature. Find balance between learning and comfort. As you spend time working on and learning something, you will become an expert in it. But you also become comfortable with it. And then you don't want to go back to that unknown, scary, uncomfortable place of learning something new. You should always be trying to learn something new be exploring something new. Comfortable is good, but getting stuck and afraid is really bad. And so often, it's just a matter of knowing how to respond. When you're comfortable in your tech, when, you're, when you know quite well what needs to be done, you have clear pictures in your head of what needs to happen, and suddenly a project comes to an end, and you're put into a new project with different tech or a mix between some of what you've done previously and some of what you need to do anew that you've never seen or worked with before. I often see people with kind of 
start and did not know a lot in the beginning as expected because they've not worked with this stuff before. But they did spend maybe a half a day, maybe a whole day, and they'd be like, oh, I can't do this. This is too difficult. Um, I have no idea what's going on. As, as if that is not supposed to be happening. That is what's supposed to be happening. Anyone with experience will understand this. You're confronted with something new, with something you haven't worked with before, and you need to be able to rely on your teammates, your leads, your team leads, um, to help you through it. You're not going from an expert to being an expert. You're going from being an expert to kind of being a junior to some extent. And so don't feel shy to ask for help. Don't feel shy to ask others for assistance, especially those who are much more comfortable with what you're working with. When you're lost and you don't know which direction to go in, there are, so to speak, 360 angles in that circle of which you can step into. And that's a lot of unknown. However, with a little bit of assistance and just one or two pointers, suddenly all of that unknown can disappear. So it's critically important to know when to ask for help and ask for that help. But also important to accept within yourself that I'm making this transition from being an expert to not currently being an expert, at least for a few weeks or a few months until you get back to that level of knowledge that you require. Learn your stress limits and take a moment to breathe when you're getting close. This is a bit of for yourself as a developer, but also equally for your teammates because when things get bad, in many cases, your teammates are going to bear the brunt of that. This is of extreme priority, no matter how stressful the situation is. No work is going to get done if you burn out. Stand up and just walk out. People have done it. Some of them have never written a line of code ever again. Consequences be damned. And that's, that's the reality of burnout, is that it is a bridge that is completely burnt, that there is no way to cross again. Again, okay, that's, that's an extreme example. Um, but it's, it's what happens. And unfortunately, it often happens at the time where you're most, where the business is most able to accommodate it. It's not a case of, okay, we've got another four and a half months to get this project done. You are completely mentally toasted. Please take a week off. We can catch up the time. No, this is gonna happen like three days before your deadline or the night before your deadline. So you need to preempt that. You need to try to manage it and you need to take your breaks. Um, you need to take a breather. You need to walk away. You have to do it. No matter how stressful the situation is, you have to do it because the consequences can be far worse than just that one deadline or that one project. <clears throat> There's a type of person that I've seen in a lot of teams that I've worked with. Um, very fortunate that a current team I'm working in does not have one of these types of individuals, but there's always that guy, the guy who just is not afraid to just call out to the room, to the room, 
Who wrote this code? Don't people think? Do they actually think this is good code? What the hell, people? Don't be that guy. There are ways to address these issues and address them. You are talking to people. Act like it. Another thing that makes working in teams fairly tricky and fairly difficult is the idea of roles and titles. Architects, team leads, tech leads, senior developers, junior developers, and other developer-specific roles as well that you can find on occasion. Who are in these roles and what are they supposed to be doing? Therein lies your first problem. There are some general guidelines, but there is no one clear answer. If you go to five different companies and you go and speak to those five architects in those companies, assuming they even have them, you're going to be speaking to five individuals with different roles and different responsibilities. And that's simply because in each company, they have these requirements, they have these tasks that need to be done, and they have to assign people to do it. Very few companies are set in their, their breakdown of um, roles. Some companies work with two large 20 member teams, other people, other companies work with eight four man teams. And they adapt based on what is required, what has worked, what the experience has been, who the leadership people are in those companies that make these decisions. All of these create dif differentiation. Generally, an architect does not write code. They are one foot on the business side and one foot on the technical side. You could be sitting there looking at a requirement, trying to decide, should I put this into one page or should I put this onto two web pages? An architect will be looking at the same thing and thinking, how is this going to affect debtors and creditors? Should we be going into the cloud? Um, what kind of database structure we'll be using? So for many scenarios, an architect is only involved in a project when needed. They're there generally more in the beginning as major technical decisions need to be made and they need to confirm that what is being done is aligned with what needs to happen in the business and what are the effects on the rest of the business as to what you're working on and future projects um, based on those effects. So they kind of operate at that higher level generally. And it's a very large generalization because in some companies, an architect is an equivalent of a team lead where they do very little design. And in other places, they're extremely in the management space where they do very little technical work, yet they're kind of responsible, almost like an IT manager kind of um, position, but perhaps an IT development manager rather than a generalized IT manager. So there is, a, just in that one role, there can be a lot of um, variation. Team leads, generally a team lead is somebody who's looking after the members of the team, to both technically and from a people management perspective. Um, they're your in-between from yourself to HR 
and they're also your in between between yourself and your direct manager. Um, and so often, if either of those discussions need to happen, they may be there with you to help you and guide you. Um, they're the one person you should always be able to go and talk to about anything. Um, and, and, yeah, and they're there to, to take care of you. Team leaders often code as well. There's a very rare scenarios where I've seen where a team lead has been a purely leadership role. Um, but it can happen, certainly in, um, in larger teams. Tech leads. Technical leads are like team leads, but without the people management perspective. They're, to some respects, halfway between a team lead as, and an architect, as eventually, once they leave code behind, architecture is almost always the role that they will step up into. Um, but otherwise, they will often work with architects to interpret their decisions, to take the high-level decisions that architects make and bring them down to the developers in a way and format that developers can understand. And they often act as, to some extent, to make those decisions themselves and in others to act as the, as the in-between from the developers to the architects. So in all of these roles, from company to company, there's going to be variation. Um, not all team leads are cut out to lead. They kind of take it as a step up from development to a higher position, to move their careers forward, to move their salaries higher. And not all of them are, are cut out for it. Um, many companies will give you that po position and title with almost no training, almost no guidance on the actual leadership side of it. And so you end up with many team leads who are largely just developers who people occasionally come and talk to if, if they have something to discuss. And so there's all sorts of these different mixes and matches in companies. Um, these, these roles that are sometimes done correctly and done incorrectly. And so as someone who is junior, who is joining into these companies, it is important to keep th this in mind, to keep in mind that this is what is going to occur. Um, there is no one way that these roles are filled. And from one company to the next company, an architect, a team lead, a tech lead, will and can be different individuals. Um, not, not just different individuals, but different responsibilities. Um, and the individuals who fill those roles can differ quite drastically. So I've made some notes here on different um, facets of knowledge, as I call them, um, because it's something often as developers, we don't think about that much. Um, what are these different ways that people think, these different scopes that people operate in around us as developers? Um, and, and, and thinking along these lines and um, trying to discover more about these topics can often be incredibly helpful because we don't develop in isolation and the projects that we work in don't exist in isolation. There are other departments that look at them, there are other departments that work with them, and there are many different role players who have had input and who have responsibility over these projects. And trying to understand these different um, areas can help make you a much more rounded developer. So there's the area that we're probably most familiar with, which is the technical area, i.e. I can write code, build a website, 
I can work my way around the database, etc. Then there's um, what I call soft technical. Um, areas that are directly related but not necessarily have to do with code. Things like documentation, internal processes, communication, company processes even. Then there's what I call user knowledge. And this is going to differ drastically from company to company. How do users think? What are their goals? What's their skill level? What is their expectations of the current project that I'm working on? And on any project, trying to speak to an end user to understand what their expectation is, is can be critically important because in many cases, the managers who are making the decisions for a project are not the people on the ground who are using it on a daily basis. So getting to speak to those people who are on the ground, chatting to them about the project, getting their feedback can really help you understand the, the scope in which your project exists, this environment in which your project exists or will exist. And that, that can be incredibly valuable to help you understand when you're sitting in meetings, when you're having discussions, when you're seeing requirements that you will not be blindly looking at how to simply turn this into code. You will be thinking about what are people actually doing with this product. Then there's industry knowledge. Um, and in some companies, this is incredibly important. What are the industry norms? What are the laws and bylaws to do with this industry? What are our competitors like and what are they doing? For some companies and for some products, these are incredibly critical things to know. Yet as a developer, you're not required to know it. So it is up to you to kind of try to get some idea if these are applicable to you, to try to get some idea of what they're about. Then there's project knowledge. Management and the decisions management is making. Why are they making those decisions? Their expectations, the deadlines, why those deadlines have been set. Scope, scope of this project and scope creep and history of a project as well. Then there's knowledge of people, knowing your teammates, knowing the managers, testers and business analysts, as well users, if it applies, knowing people, getting to know who you need to talk to to get certain answers, incredibly important. Then there's corporate knowledge, company rules, policies and procedures. Talking to HR, their expectations for you, their policies and procedures. Certainly you will find as you work with different companies that they have different styles of managing people within their companies and even different styles for different departments within those companies. If you're working in a company that does um, manufacturing, almost definitely you're going to see some difference in rules to those who are on the lowest level on the manufacturing floor, to those who are working in IT, to those who are working in management. And that's normal, but be aware of that. Try to understand those differences. Um, because you never know when it could either harm you or it could help you. All right. Um, and so to do with teamwork, um, I actually have a story to share um, from fairly early on in my career. So I was working in a company that had a 
a fairly small um, IT department. Um, and in that, it was an IT manager, a team lead, myself as an intermediate developer, and one junior developer. And that was it. That, that was basically the, the software department. Um, and after spending some time as an intermediate developer, I was um, looking to, to kind of move up. And, <clears throat> and they were not quite prepared to um, uh, take me on as a senior developer because they felt I was um, not quite at that level yet. But also, they, they did not want a senior developer in, in the company. So I started to look around and um, sent my CVs to the recruiters. And so two possible positions came, came, came through. And I went through to the interviews. And both interviews seemed to go quite well. So I was like, all right, OK. And there was definitely one company that I wanted to join over the other. But honestly, I was quite happy to join both. Um, and one of the main criteria was I wanted to be able to work in a larger team, or certainly a department that had more senior developers that I could speak to, that I could um, learn from, that who could, who could mentor me. And so um, I told the recruiter, OK, the one company, my second choice, has come through with an offer, and, and they, they want to discuss this offer. And, but the, 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 my first choice company had not quite come back yet. So I told the recruiter, OK, here's what we do, right? Can we store them for at least two or three days um, and say, I'm, I'm still trying to make up my mind or, or some such reason. Hopefully by then my first choice will come through with a decision and then I can, I can make my decision accordingly. And so the first choice came through and they said, unfortunately, no, we, you're not quite senior enough for the position that we had in mind. All right, no problem. So I go back to the recruiter and say, okay, so they've said no. So please tell the first company, tell them, uh, the, the company that came through first to say, okay, I'd, I'd like to talk about this offer. And if y'all are making an offer, I'd like to accept the position. So that's where we were. And a day passed, and two days passed, and a week passed. No word from the recruiter. No response email. No, nothing. Now, okay, I figured, all right. This person must be busy. I'm sure they'll, they'll get back to me soon. Eventually, a second week passed, and I, at this point, I decided, no, uh, uh, I, I need to do something. So I contacted the recruitment company, and lo and behold, the recruiter I was working with no longer works with them. So she's moved on, and she doesn't know... Um, no, none of the other recruiters have taken on the workload was aware of my, my application. So I gave them an update. And so they contacted my second choice company. And the second choice company responded to them and said, oh, well, we were told by the recruiter that I am not interested in the position and that they must find somebody else. So the recruiter was puzzled. I was puzzled, and I told them, no, 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 listen, that's, that's not what I said, right? This is what the story was, and I was quite honest about it. And so they got back to the company, and the company said, okay, well, let's meet up, and we can chat about it. And that's what we did. So I, I went through for another interview, and we sat again, and they were quite frank, and they said, listen, we were very happy to take you on. Um, um, and so, you know, um, if you're still happy and you've made up your decision and you're, and you're, and you're wanting to join, we will take you on. So I was like, okay, no, I am. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I quite like this department and, you know, the work that's done here. And so, yes, I'm, I'm happy to join. 
So, slight backtrack. When I went through for my first interview, um, they had, at that point, I'd say probably about 13 to 15 senior devs in two teams. When I joined them, after that interview, after the second interview, it was, at that point, it had probably been about three months that had passed since my first interview. By the time I actually joined, they were, I think it was one senior dev, one intermediate dev, and the one senior dev had been a team lead. Basically, almost the entire software development department had left in that three month period. The reasons, I, I basically everything I got in the years that I worked there was basically, they were unhappy. So as, as much I was, as I was hoping for to say, I wanted to be in a department with a lot of senior developers whom I could learn with, I was back to square one. Nonetheless, it was an incredibly important time of my career because it was during this time that I discovered that I can pick up almost any product that I've never seen before, just get some idea of what it's meant to be doing and figure it out. Um, and it was something that I was very fortunate to go through because it's been a large part, it's done a lot to build my own confidence. There was one other thing that went sideways um, with, with that entire process, which I, which I only learned way after the fact. So when I went through for this, my second interview, the head of HR at this company had also left at this time. Um, and it turns out that the recruiter I had originally gone with and the head of HR at this company were best friends. So when I told my recruiter, stall them and, you know, let's see if we can slow this process down a bit so that I have my choice. It didn't quite work out that way because the recruiter still told the head of HR what was going on. And that person's response was basically, oh, well, if he doesn't want us as, their, as his first choice, then we, we don't want him. And so we're basically going to just let the whole thing fade and not really make him an offer. So that's kind of what happens um, in, in software. It's, it's an unusual one. But these things happen. Miscommunications happen. Things can change dramatically within two or three months, sometimes even less. And all you got to do is you got to try to keep your eyes open, try to be aware, and make the best of a bad situation if you find yourself to be in one. All right. So... I think let's let's call it there. Um, like I've said before, kind of cutting up these discussions into clean, neat topics usually does not work, um, and it's because everything is so interrelated to everything else that that that's that's just the nature of the industry of the software development industry, and. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to take apart. Um, yeah. All right. So um, time for some uh, Q&A. Um, yeah. We, if you have any questions, you're welcome to drop them in Twitch chat. I see I have some questions in, um, on our Discord server as well. So anytime you're watching this and you have your own questions, your own um, concerns, something you'd like to discuss. Our Discord server is always available. We have the questions and answers chat channel. Please pop in, 
drop your questions there. If you're watching this on YouTube, that's the YouTube comments again. Feel free to ask your questions there. Um, all right, let's have a look. All right, so first question. I have seen developers go through slumps where they just don't want to write code anymore. What would be the best way to go about getting out of said slump? All right. So there, there are a few reasons slumps happen. And um, you know, on the one hand, you could go to the extreme and say, you know what, a burnout is, is essentially a slump. You're done. You don't want to do this anymore, or you can't do it anymore. Um, but that is a, a bit more of a, an extreme scenario. One of the more common scenarios I've seen is what I call um, project burnout. When projects get so out of hand that even the smallest changes are painful to work with. And there are many experts um, who've, spoken to, um, who've spoken on <laughs> this idea of uh, projects and poor project management and scope creep and any number of um, um, other issues, um, even not allocating sufficient amounts of time to clean up your code, to clean up the project, to refactor. Those are important because as the project gets larger, as the project gets older, as you get more and more individuals who are working with the project, who have not worked with it from the beginning, who have very little experience in this code space, it becomes more and more critically important that it's neat, it's concise, it's well architected, it's um, robust, it's easy to make changes to, and easy to make changes in a manner that does not make it harder to make changes down the road. Um, so. This is often um, a form of slump that I've seen um, developers run into, not, not for their own slump personally, but for the project that they're working in, what they have to go in and do, the process that they have to go through, that, they, that they're aware of and they know, and they don't know how to do anything better. Um, so yeah, so from that perspective, you know, you often find um, a, a slump in, in that manner. Um, and like I said, it's less to do with the developers and often to do with the, with the project. But when they're more aware of this, um, then it's easier for them to put their minds into a better space to come out of the slump. Um, often, I encourage developers to never be looking at only one thing continuously. Even if you have to work with one project day in and day out, it's a, it's a six month um, effort that you gotta put in. In that scenario, there's no escaping it. You're gonna be working with this thing for the next six months, if not more. But don't make that the only thing that you work on. Do some other dev watch some other videos, plan your day out so that you can break down your tasks so that it is not quite so painful to have to think about this entire chunk of work you have to do. Break it down, not just in what you need to do, but in your mind. Put additional, for lack of a better word, positive distractions in between um, what you have to work on. Time yourself for your tasks so that you can better predict and cut up your work um, in a more productive manner. When you've managed to do something that's small, take the morale boost. Consciously do it. Say, ah, okay, I assigned myself three hours to do this task. I did it in two and a half. Fantastic. 
Look how great my day is going. Take the positives, push the positives out of these scenarios. If you don't do it, you are going to end up in a slump. So eventually. So it is the small things that you do, small positives that you boost up that will help you stay out of these slumps um, as much as possible. Um, along those same lines is um, also something I call tech tiredness. Working with too much of the same thing all the time. It is just so terribly boring that just thinking about doing it is depressing. And that happens. When you, you know, when you get comfortable with, let's say, uh, a web framework to build websites, and you can do it incredibly easily, you can build out good UIs incredibly quickly, and then that's what your value becomes to the company. And so they just give you more and more and more and more of that. And you know, before you know it, you started off doing a little two-page site, and a year later, they're asking you to do 30-page projects in a month. And that's all you're doing. And the pressure is not relenting, and the work is easy. The work is easy. You're not stressed out. You're getting it done. But it's just so much of the same that it's just it's difficult to work up the energy, to work up the excitement, to, to be up about what you're doing becomes incredibly difficult. And so for that, a lot of the same rules kind of apply. Um, um, as the previous point, you know, break it up, um, mix it up. Don't just actually do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, manage your efficiencies. Don't just, um, as you get faster, as this gets easier, don't just send those efficiencies straight through to the business. If for example, you started off and you had to do a task and it took you two weeks to do that task. And after two months, it takes you one week to do that task. And then it takes you, after a little while, three days to do that task. Consider limiting it at that point for yourself. Even if it's now taking you one day to do that task, consider limiting it at three days and sp spread out that time or maybe limit it to two days. There's a lot that goes into this decision. Companies would not want you to do it, but companies are really there to look out for your mental state, your emotional state at work, your mental state at work, your emotional state at work. Um, it's, it's a very hands-off process for them. They obviously want you to be in a good space. They don't necessarily want to make the decisions for you to be in the good space. So from that perspective, you got to make the right decision. Starting off at two weeks and limiting it to two days, something that you can do in one day, that's a good decision. That'll help you spread out, that'll help you learn more, and that'll not need you to basically work flat out eight hours on the same thing a day to hit the expectations that the company requires. While that may be very healthy for the company, that is not necessarily very healthy for you as the individual. So, yeah. So slumps, there are many reasons. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there, there are many different differentiating factors. Um, with us as individuals, as developers, that makes building an effective team very difficult. All of these can lead to some sort of slump. Um, whether you had a, an, an, an argument with your team lead, um, and perhaps that's the first time you had a, a serious 
um, seriously had it out with someone in the professional space. Um, that can lead you into a slump for a few days or a few weeks even before you can kind of emotionally reset. Um, and in, th in those kinds of emotional scenarios, go and speak. Go and speak to the individual. Go and speak to your team lead. Even if you don't have something to complain about, even if you don't have a particular point, go and just speak to them. Because often that process of just talking about it can pull something out of that emotionally murky space and that process of um, putting it into words can become a rock that your emotions can settle around and calm down. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's a matter of understanding. They will speak to you and explain to you, listen, these things happen. It's all right. You don't have to be worried about it. Nobody's going to fire you because you, you had an argument with the team lead. Your job is not in jeopardy. You don't need to be concerned. He's not going to hate you for the rest of his life. He's not going to have it out for you. All of that decision you got to make yourself. But it's very rarely that that level of lack of professionalism exists. Um, but it can happen. Um, but you know, many doubts and uncertainties can linger from or can come out of these kinds of incidents. And um, speaking to someone about it can help you get a clearer picture of where you stand and what the concern is, what went wrong, how to approach it in future, how to talk to this particular person. Um, there's been many scenarios, many um, where I would say something and someone would be upset about it. I'll turn into an argument and I'll turn and someone more senior down the road will speak to me and say, listen, this is the situation with this guy. So in the future, be aware. And that makes all the difference because not in a hundred years would I have seen what this person has told me about myself. So, you know, go speak to someone. Um, and often, it can be helpful. But unfortunately, slums occur because we aim to get better and more efficient at doing largely the same thing. Um, so in that process, it's different for different people, but you're going to kind of start getting tired. You're going to get tired of this tech. You're going to get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and it can sometimes even happen from the opposite direction. You will be chatting to someone who you just met, was in a different team, and he'll be telling you about something, and it's exciting, and it's interesting, and it's something you've not worked with before, and it's something you've not heard of before. And you're now wanting to go and read up on this, maybe do the tutorials, maybe watch some YouTube videos on this, and you can't because you got work to do. You got, you got uh, deadlines to meet. You got stuff to push out. And that excitement can very quickly turn into frustration. That frustration will tell you, listen, you know what, okay, it's fine. I'm going to spend two hours in the morning watching some YouTube videos on... Um, this framework or just doing the tutorial quickly and I'll catch up on the work at the end of the day. So I'll, I'll work an additional two hours at the end of the day. And you do that a few days in a row and often people are going to start noticing that you're not, not hitting your deadlines. Suddenly you're not going at the pace you should be going because you're going to be more tired trying to do what you're doing, you know, your, your daily work. And so those eight hours and the work that you've kind of was able to produce during those eight hours, the eight hours that comes after the two hours is not going to go as far. You're not going to be as well rested. And so even though you're working the eight hours, you're 
concentration levels are not going to be up to it. And what you're going to produce is either going to be of a poorer quality or of a lower quantity. So, yeah, slums can happen for many reasons. All right, next question. All right. What books or good reads would you recommend to a finance person going into the development industry, but not as a developer? Just so that person has a better understanding of how the dev industry works. Hmm. I'm not sure I've actually seen any books that come that, that cover that exact topic. The closest that would probably come that I can think of is probably something you would do at perhaps uh, like an higher management or an MBA level based around um, IT as a department um, in, and how it kind of slots into companies at a higher level. And, and probably part of the reason is that um, that's probably one of the most common scenarios that you would have. Um, and, and, and scenarios such as the one year where you're a finance person going into the development industry. So, okay, if you mean I'm a finance person who's going into a company that does software development, I suppose that's, that's more clearly defined. Um, you run into the problem that I mentioned earlier, or, or kind of throughout these talks, the theme of there's no one way that companies do it. There's some vague suggestions, shall I say, and from, there's some of those who talk and write about at a very high level for large companies, you know, for the... <clears throat> Facebooks and the Microsofts, the Amazons and the, the Oracles. <clears throat> you have probably thousands of software developers and probably a few hundred teams in some cases. Um, in those cases, you kind of want to try to have some sort of standardization across the board. But those are few big companies. The large number of companies have much smaller budgets, have much fewer developers, and kind of have to make do with what they can. And there's many different complex scenarios that lead them to have or not have different roles, have different responsibilities, additional responsibilities, for roles, have roles that may not exist even outside of the company simply because of the particular mix of budget, team size, and industry, and um, perhaps growth phase that the company is in, and their experience that they've gone through, they may decide to have three leadership roles per team instead of the a two or the more traditional one. Um, they may want to have a, a, a junior architect in each team rather than one senior architect overlooking the three teams, as an example. And these can be cut many, many different ways. And so from that perspective, you got to try to learn about as much as possible how your particular company does it. Um, if you're looking at, an, at the industry, localization to the industry is incredibly important. The software industry in Japan is very different to the software industry in Australia, which is very different to South Africa or Europe or um, South America or the US or Canada. And there's a large amount of localization that happens in that space. So from that perspective, um, or from those two perspectives of 
localization and at the company level. Um, try to go out there and speak to individuals who are in this space. Look at and see who are the top two or three companies and see what um, often there are groups, there are get-togethers. Most often it's based around a particular technical um, aspect, maybe a certain database group, maybe an agile community. Try to find these, speak to individuals within that space and go to them. I mean, you're not a developer and so you're not going to learn anything from um, that particular uh, topic that is being discussed. But, is the, <clears throat> but it is an opportunity to speak to individuals who are out there, senior individuals, junior individuals, and kind of find out how things are done within their company. If you listen to the questions, even if you take the technical knowledge out of it, if you go to a database um, discussion and you listen to the Q&A, almost definitely you will have someone who will ask a question that it's going to be along the lines of, okay, Mr. Speaker, you've talked about this thing and how you've seen it done this way, right? But in my company, we're doing it differently and we're doing it differently for this reason. And what can you tell me about that? And even taking the, the technical discussions out of it, you can learn a lot of information on how they ask these questions, how they talk about their companies. Um, you, there's a lot of value to be gained there um, as someone who is not a developer. And these are open, so you, know, they, you often don't have to pay for them. You can go through, you can join the community, and um, you, you really can learn a lot about the, how other companies do it in your space and um, what they do and what decisions they make and why they make those decisions at these discussions. As well as there's often managers there, um, there are often um, individuals who are very high up. Um, the, the promoters of these events, you will have, um, they try, they, in many cases, they use these as selling points. So they will try to encourage managers and decision makers in companies to come through to see what the other companies are doing, how they're using these products, how amazing these products always seem to be for every company that uses them. And the, from this, they, because they, they want more people to try to adopt this product. So, but it offers you an opportunity to speak to these managers and say, you know what? I'm from the, the, the finance space. I've been looking at the software industry. Ask your questions. Speak to them. They're often happy to talk to you and happy to help. Um, so, so that's probably the, the best I can do in terms of how to help. Um, I, I, I'd be a bit surprised if there are really any books um, that you can find that will assist you. Simply And if they are, I, I would want to have a read before I can, I, I can suggest it because my experience tells me it's really difficult to take something like the development industry and, 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 and kind of distill it down into this is what it is because it is changing, it is different, it is very localized. Um, and and, and that's, that's what I've seen. That's, that's what I've seen, um, you know, everywhere I've, kind, everywhere I've been. So, yeah. So, if there are any other questions, please, again, drop them in chat. Um, but also, like I've said previously, a video is uploaded to YouTube, so you're most welcome to go and um, watch those if you've missed any of the previous videos. Um, yeah. The next, <clears throat> next video will be on um, Thursday at 8 p.m. And we will talk about being a good employee.
Um, so please join us then. Otherwise, everyone, have a fantastic rest of your week. Uh, and be well, be safe. Uh, yeah. Cheers, everybody.